Good afternoon. Welcome to Target 2020 with newer generation IOLs. So could I ask, call for Dr. Jayendan, is he here, to join me on stage? Dr. Archana, are you here? Ah, why don't you join? Oh, you're going to be the first speaker. So let me call upon Dr. Archana, who's going to talk to us on defocus curve and multifocality. It's quite important that when we try to assess uh, multifocality, we don't just look at uncorrected vision for distance or near. We understand multifocality by looking at defocus curves. We should learn how to do it and how to interpret it. Arsena, it's yours. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to, uh, on behalf, I would like to thank the scientific committee for giving me this wonderful opportunity. So with the increasing patient demands for high quality vision and the desire for complete spectacle independence, the number of IOL options for the correction of presbyopia during cataract surgery is growing. So our mission as cataract surgeons is to help patients determine where in their daily life they want to see without spect spectacle correction and to maximize the quality of vision in zones that mas matter most to them. Based on the IOL design variables, there are a myriad of multifocals available. Based on the optical principle, they could be refractive, diffractive or combination of both. And based on the focality, they could be bifocals, trifocals or extended depth of focus IOLs. So, uh, based on the optical principle, in, they are classified into the refractive and the diffractive IOLs. So, what are what is the defocus curve? So, these are the points under which I will be discussing about them. So, what is it? Why is it important? How is it measured? How is it influenced? And how is it relevant to our clinical practice? So, what is a defocus curve? It is a strong objective clinical measure of how well a lens is correcting presbyopia. It also directly addresses the main factor that drives patients to consider a presbyopia correcting IOL in the first place, that is a desire to, uh, for good visual acuity at all distances. So how is it measured? Usually how, we me uh, how do we measure visual acuity? It is traditionally determined by manually placing visual acuity charts at discrete testing distances, such as, like, say, for distance at 6 meters or near at 40 centimeters. But when we have to evaluate the effect of an IOL, or like a trifocal IOL or extended depth of IOL, we have to assess the visual acuity at different testing points. So it would be impractical to move either the chart or the patient towards each other. So what can be done? So before going into that, some basics. We all know that accommodation is zero, is zero in pseudofix and the focal length in meters is inversely proportional to the dioptric power of the lens. So any emetropic person with one diopter of accommodation can clearly can see clearly at a distance of one meter and hence when we place a minus one diopter lens it effectively tests the vision at one meter. See for example if there is a pseudophagic patient say with a trifocal IOL in C2 and they are first made to uh, sit at a distance of 6 meters with the best corrected visual activity of 6.6. Six. Now, if we place a minus 1 diopter lens in the trial frame, actually they should experience a blurring of vision. If the patient still continues to see 6.6, six, it means that the IOL is contributing to a 1 diopter add effect. So, if we view a distant object through a minus 1 diopter lens, we are creating an optically equivalent uh, condition of viewing an object at one meter and so on and so forth. Like if we place a distant object, we are viewing a distant object through a minus four diopter lens, it's optically equivalent to viewing an object at 25 centimeters. The defocus curve then provides an objective measure of expected vision at different distances. So in a defocus curve test, Whenever we place, see, for example, if we place a minus two diopter lens in the trial frame in a pseudophagic patient, <clears throat> due to a hyperopic shift, we are actually checking uh, the optical equivalence at a distance of 50 centimeters. So this is how the defocus curve will be plotted. And with the diopters of defocus plotted along the x-axis and the visual acuity plotted along the y-axis, it could be in Snellens or in Logmar. 
So as successive lenses are introduced, acuity is likely to change and a typical range of defocus testing is usually done from plus 1 to minus 4 or planar to minus 4 diopters. So these are just, uh, I'll be just displaying a couple of uh, slides showing. So this is when we compare two different IOLs, like a monofocal IOL and a trifocal IOL. So monofocal IOL where the best corrected visual equity maximum uh, is excellent for infinity, for distance vision, but progressively it keeps reducing for intermediate and for near. Whereas for a trifocal, we see that uh, it is best for distance and then again at an intermediate zone of uh, 66 uh, centimeters and then for the near zone. So this is again a defocus curve uh, which is anticipated and then which is predicted for uh, the different IOLs including the extended depth of focus IOL. So this is a defocus curve which we can easily, which we ourselves can perform in our OPD. It may be slightly time consuming, but this is the concept, it is a very simplified chart. So uh, the increments of the uh, lenses to be placed in the trial frame are plotted along the x-axis and the visual ac acuity along the y-axis and these are the three main zones which we are looking at. So we can check patients with a, a extended depth of focus IOL or a trifocal IOL or a multifocal IOL. So we can assess for ourselves how effective these IOLs are and not just go by the claim of the lens manufacturer. So how is it still influenced? It's influenced by the pupil size, low contrast visual equity, by induced astigmatism and uh, we adjusting for optical infinity. And we try to usually overcome these factors, these influencing factors, especially any residual refractive error by best correcting the, by before the patient starts doing the defocus curve, we'll make him wear his best correction. Pupil size is another factor which can influence where a smaller pupil usually tends to produce less optical aberrations. Larger pupil can produce more optical aberrations. The American Academy of Ophthalmology Task Force for the Extended Depth of Focus IOL suggested stratification of data into small, medium and large pupils size groups with a pupil diameter being measured on the same day and under the same conditions as the defocus curve test. Contrast sensitivity also is a factor which can influence the outcomes here. Low contrast visual equity testing of a patient's ability to see low contrast letters that is grey on white has been increasingly used in the assessment of trifocal and EDOF IOLs. Not all IOLs defocus outcomes are equally affected though by the reductions in contrast. So how is it assessed? Once we do the defocus curve, there could be a direct comparison of the defocus level, range of focus analysis or area under the curve analysis. Direct comparison is the simplest where point to point we compare between uh, the different uh, IOLs at different focal points and the next is the area under the curve analysis where the defocus curve is separated into the distance, the intermediate and the near sections and the entire AUC that dips beneath the 0.3 logma is calculated and expressed as logma per meter. The greater the area under the curve, the better would be the visual equity with that section. So, to, how many women do we see here? It appears to be three. Well, so the objective of my uh, talk, although it is a lot of theory, is that uh, although each IOL manufacturer generates marketing data that depict favorable results for its uh, implant designs based on lab testing like modulation transfer function, and Air Force bar targets, but this defocus curve is the real world measure of IOL performance and it's the best objective indicator of expected range of vision. So this would help us set realistic expectations for our patients. In addition to chromatic aberrations, modulation transfer functions, sterl ratio, visual equity, contrast sensitivity, and patient reported outcome testing, defocus curves will serve as another key tool to assess performance of presbyopia correcting IOLs. Thank you. So thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Archana. It was a very uh, nice, precise, and very clear presentation. Uh, we'll have to take up the questions later on. Uh, Dr. Sir. Arul uh, will be the next speaker. Uh, there is a change in the schedule because uh, of, uh, I think Dr. Lyonan has not yet reported, isn't there? So next speaker is going to be Dr. Arul Modi Verman.
he is a teacher to almost all of us in this hall and he will be speaking on continuous range of vision crv i will good afternoon dr uh, archana did tell us the importance about doing the defocus curve plotting so those of you who are very keen of understanding the performance of a multifocal eye oil please do defocus curve for every single patient in whom you are implanting a multifocal eye oil in my practice everybody who has got a multifocal lens get off lens defocus curve was done multiple number of times to make sure that we getting the proper result from that particular lens that is when you can actually judge the lens's performance second you need to find out the contrast sensitivity that if you have the tools for example you have the eye trace then you can actually trace out the modulate modulation transfer function and predict the patient's contrast sensitivity in that way you can actually choose a lens that will give excellent contrast sensitivity as well as the best defocus curves and get the best results for your patients so now continuous range of vision is the holy grail of presbyopia correction that's been something you've been looking for for a very long time as the name implies you're trying to get clear vision right from infinity to near and the quality of vision also should be high that's what we're looking for and this will be the kind of a defocus curve that you want which is flat almost flat of course the tail has to dip down that's law of physics if the tail goes up here then the quality of vision goes down at this point so we are fighting against laws of physics to lift the tail up and make it absolutely flat i don't know probably we'll get there so what this tells you is this patient has a very good accommodation pseudo accommodation it's induced by this particular lens to a power of approximately 2.25 to 2.5 that means this person can need read near pretty efficiently intermediate very efficiently distance very well we need to understand this so we're all shifting to digital platforms cell phones pads laptops computers tv so we need to have multi multi distance clarity that's very very necessary if you have multi focal eye oil it's very good for distance bifocal and then for near intermediate is poor you've got in a trifocal it depending on the near vision ad it depends what kind of an ad you have near intermediate but other areas are blurred out whenever you have rings be it bifocal or trifocal you're going to have loss of light almost 20% of light is lost and that's what causes poor contrast sensitivity as well as glare and halos so you you want a product that would give you the performance of a trifocal or better without the photic phenomena of a trifocal that's a kind of lens which we look at as a continuous range of vision lens and it also should work under low light low light quality quantity of light also so limiting factors are older multiple uh, multifocal lenses we had to have some kind of a spectacal dependence decrease contrast sensitivity it was pupil dependent most of the time increase glare and halos so today what would be the standard that you would compare for the vision it would be trifocal you want things to get better than trifocal not worse so that's where we are so crv lenses there are two part two lenses there the edof lenses which are the standard vanilla lenses and you have the advanced edof lenses which i'm going to talk to you about the edof lens uh, the uh, example i like to give you would be ihans ihans the company claims a near vision ad that is built into the system of around 1.25 to 1.5 but eventually when you look at it you get about 0.75 maybe one ad for a patient who's got an ihans in the eye that means intermediate distance is reasonably good near is usually not good but the advantage is no glare and halos at all so if you have a patient is looking only for intermediate vision does not mind wearing glasses for near then a lens a standard uh, edof lens like ihans would serve very well so what is an advanced edof lens an advanced edof lens does not work on rings does not work on a smooth addition that is built in but it works by inducing positive spherical aberrations in the central 1 and 1/2 mm zone so the, sp the spherical aberration is increased in the central 1 and 1/2 mm zone and the lens is well centered in the capsular bag there is huge amount of depth of focus that is achieved so these patients would get 6 by 6 for distance and 6 for near with high quality vision but of course there is some amount of drop in quality of vision but not as much as you would get with a trifocal or a bifocal so this is the defocus ka achana showed you what is what you are looking at this this would be the standard bifocal lens and the other one that you are looking is a standard head off where the trail tail drops off somewhere about minus 1.5 that means we get a near vision ad of around 1.25 what you want a dream lens is one that would go flat like this 
So we have to do, when you want to evaluate these lenses, do the defocus curve and look for a lens that gives you that kind of a result. So the advanced EDOF lenses, there are two types of lenses available in the market today. One, I would give you the example would be Synergy. Synergy takes the trifocal or the bifocal and then adds on EDOF, that's a symphony, and then comes up with a synergetic product, that's why they call it Synergy. So with a symphony lens, you would get good distant vision, less photic phenomena, good intermediate vision, and fair near vision. With the bifocal lens, thickness bifocal, you'll get excellent near vision, but you'll have more photic phenomena. When they married both these together, they made an advanced EDOF lens, which they call Synergy. Results are excellent. It's as good visually as a trifocal, but reduced contrast sensitivity issues. Contrast sensitivity is better. Glare and halos is reduced. Normally, in a regular multifocal lens or a trifocal lens, up to about 18 to 19 percent of light is scattered or lost. That's what causes glare and halos. In the advanced model of lenses, the amount of light loss is somewhere between 11 to 12 percent. That means 88 percent lens, the light is focused. So the quality of vision is better as well as glare and halos is lesser. So when you look at a real advanced speed of lens rather than a synergetic lens, that would induce positive vibration in the central one and a half millimeter zone. This lens will have no rings whatsoever. It will look exactly like a monofocal. But it will give you the benefits of a multifocal. The, the sample example of this lens would be the Apasami's uh, Swiss foam, which gives you fantastic quality of vision with no glare and halos and excellent near vision intermediate as well as distance. So as of today, if you're looking at what is present and what is the state of the art, would be Synergy that comes from J&J, and you have got Swiss Forb that comes from Upper Sun. Now, all the companies that are working, they're working towards finding lenses that do not have rings. And all of them are working on inducing aberrations. Who learns how to play with the aberrations, how accurately to make them, how accurately to, play, accurately to place it, and give you the appropriate amount of aberrations in the center, which will not interfere with quality of vision, is going to be the winner of the game. So this is the kind of thing. To get good results, it's just not the lens, accurate biometry, precise A constant, dry eye workup, abrometry workup, angle alpha workup, and counsel the patients. So I'll skip this. Light utilization, I told you, in these lenses is close to 90%. So I'll, I'll just show you a very, very short video. This is uh, Hehan's going in. So you'll find the number of rings are much lesser. The center is, has got less rings. The periphery has more. This lens works brilliantly. This is probably the state-of-the-art lens today. The other one, as I told you, Apasami Swiss Forb is fabulous. So MTF is something you need to look at it. This is the kind of uh, defocus curve that we got out of the Synergy. They are excellent defocus curves. will give you fantastic vision. So if you have the eye trace, you can actually do the internal MTF for every one of the lenses that you implant, and you can choose one that gives you a good MTF that gives you good contrast sensitivity. So you, you draw a line from 10 cycles to 40%, if the graph is above that, this lens has got, got good contrast sensitivity and has a good modular, modular transfer function that is excellent and acceptable. So this particular lens energy is acceptable in that range. The results are very, very good. In summary, advanced EDOF lenses as well as continuous range of vision eye oils give excellent visual results and satisfaction, and they are the future that you're looking forward to. Thank you. A very nice presentation, Dr. Arul, as usual. Uh, so we'll move on to the next topic, and that is uh, Shiva Kumar, Indigenous uh, Premium IOLs. So good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. I'll be talking about uh, indigenous premium IOLs, one in particular. I have no financial interest to declare, and uh, I thank Aurolab for some of the slides and information. So we now know that uh, the patient ex expectations are going higher, and the technology keeps improving in terms of procedures as well as IOLs. And as the technology becomes better, the patient expectations keep increasing. It's an era of convenience where a patient, who, even if he has worn a spectacles for three to four decades, doesn't want to wear it anymore after cataract surgery. 
is also the era of mobile and the mobility where everything is available on the mobile and everyone would like to uh, uh, see everything right from the morning newspaper to the evening philosophical uh, feeds uh, on the mobile. It's also an era of mobility where after 60, they no longer retire but look for a second job, go around sightseeing and it's an area of, era of mobility. So for correcting press biopia, we had the bifocals like Restore, Resume and the Indian counterparts. Currently we have the multifocals with or without toric which are actually trifocals. But what has really caught attention is the extra depth of focus lenses with or without toricity. So when we look at the crystalline lens, we get a good distance intermediate and near vision and there are hardly any distortions. But when you put a monofocal lens, we get a fairly good distance vision but the near intermediate are bad and uh, there, are, uh, there, is, there are a few distortions uh, when it decenters. When we use a bifocal, uh, the uh, distance vision falls a bit, it gives a good near vision, but the intermediate vision is not so good and there are a few distortions. When we use a trifocal, at the cost of uh, a better intermediate vision, the near vision and the distance vision is slightly reduced as compared to the bifocal, but it uh, causes less glares and halos and distortions. But when we use the EDOF, the distance vision is as good as a monofocal, the intermediate vision is better than a trifocal, and the uh, disturbances are also less. But here again, the purchase is that of losing a little bit of near vision. So uh, when we look at a patient and advice, generally we forget about the activities that involves intermediate vision, which are like climbing steps, shaving, makeup, cooking, cleaning the house, working on the desktop or a laptop, or using smartphones, making video calls. So we generally ask whether he reads closely, close by, and of course everyone wants for the distance, but this is something that we tend to sort of overlook. Uh, so we have got these EDOF lenses which fit into this category, which makes them comfortable for most of the day without spectacles. And the technologies, as we saw also previously, are using uh, and modifying the spherical and the chromatic aberrations using wavefront modifications and using diffractive rings and a hybrid with refractive and diffractive platforms. So when you look at the performance of the EDOF in comparison with uh, bifocals and trifocals available, the distance vision is good and brighter because it, the light is no longer distributed to two, different, two or three different foci. The intermediate is also better and brighter, but the uh, uh, compromise is in the near and the overall visual quality which is fair but the advantage is that it does not depend on the lighting conditions and the visual disturbances are much less. So when you compare an MFIOL and an EDOC, uh, uh, the MFIOL has got blurred distance and near vision because both the foci are simultaneous. And what lies in between those two are actually blurred. It is focused only at the two distances or the three distances. The glare, halos and ghost images do exist. There's a low contrast sensitivity and it requires a neural adaptation. But in an era of IOL, there are less glares and halos, contrast sensitivity is near normal. It does not require a neural adaptation and most activities are spectacle free unless you want to read up close. So I'll be talking about the Auroview Vivid uh, IOL, which is an external depth of focus IOL from Aurolab. It is uh, on the same Auroview EV platform that is generally used, uh, the acrylic lens. It has an overall diameter of 12.5 and a central uh, uh, and an optic of 6 mm. It's got a central 2.96 mm zone. The centermost part is 1.72 mm. And what has happened is a novel combination of a purely refractive central 1 mm, which has got a 0.9 diopters more than the base power. And the rest of that 1.72 is actually uh, the power of the IOL. There are four diffractive rings starting from 1.72 to 2.96, which accounts for about 2.1 diopters. So it brings the focus closer up to about 50 centimeters. There is a 31% light distribution to the center and beyond the 2.96 it's purely refractive which gives excellent distance vision in the night and it is a spherical IOL. Unlike all the other AuroView uh, platform IOLs, this is a non-aspheric IOL. So this increases the depth of focus. So it is actually a hybrid uh, IOL with all the technologies woven in. The AuroView multifocal, when you see that the distance is clear, but as, it, as the objects come closer to within one meter, it's blurred. Whereas AuroView uh, uh, Vivid, the EDOF lens gives a continuous focus, which makes even at one meter a, a good clarity. 
Similarly, when you compare it with the monofocal, the clarity at one meter, the distance is good, uh, but the clarity at one meter is much better than that with the monofocal. So the Auroview Vivid gives an optimal defocus curve and gives good near to far continuous focus, that is from distance to about 40 centimeters. And it gives excellent nighttime vision with no glares and halos. It has a superior contrast and good levels of spectacle independence. Looking at the visual outcomes of Auroview Vivid done in 292 cases done last year. We can see that the distance visual acuity was 6666 partial in 80% and 6969 partial in another 14%, adding up to about 95%. The corrected distance visual acuity again was 98% in uh, 66 and 69. And the uncorrected near visual acuity that we're interested in at 40 centimeters in uh, about 54% was N10 or better. So this is a workable near vision at about 40 centimeters where a patient generally keeps his mo mobile and he can sort of use a convenient font size in order to read and use this at near. And uh, 46, out of these 46 also, some would have been N12, which is again a little bit of a workable vision. The corrected visual, near visual acuity was 97% uh, uh, N6. The spherical equivalent was 98% within plus minus 0.5, 88% being at zero. And what is uh, more important is the intermediate vision, where we can see that almost 85% uh, fall within this 0.2 log mark, which translates into a 6.9 or 6.9.5 at about 40 to 60 centimeters, the intermediate vision uh, range at which we generally work. And even another 10% at 0.3, which is about 6.12, which is not bad uh, as uh, when we consider the intermediate vision. So almost 90% of them can see comfortably at the arm's distance. So to sum up, Auroview Vivid provides a good functional vision and it gives us spectacle independence to quite a large extent. It addresses the visual needs and expectations of a large proportion of patients with cataract. In fact, today it's probably uh, those who are reading up close, the numbers are actually dwindling. There are more people who look into the mobile tabs and laptops. The choice of IO is always a compromise. You, all, you, you want either of these visions to be good or you want less distortions. And in these cases, for majority of patients, the era of IO may be the best bet. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, so I would like to invite uh, uh, the past uh, procedure, uh, editor proceedings of AOS, Dr. Arup Chakravarti, sir, to talk on toric AOS. Are they the way forward? Can you bring me on the screen? So good afternoon, friends. My topic is uh, toric IOLs. Are they the way forward? Well, a single word answer to this question would be yes. We are all aware that the prevalence of different grades of astigmatism in our cataract patients is quite high. It is there in the literature uh, for the last couple of decades. So when we have an opportunity to tackle the pre-existing coronal astigmatism by em employing a todic IOL, it makes a lo lot of sense. We have been using, the, I think the, the feed has gone from the monitor from the screen. Yeah. So I mean, we have been using the todic lenses for quite some time, more than 10, 15 years now, with very good uh, gratifying uh, results. Uh, over the years, the outcomes have evolved. You know, it has become better and better because of you know better understanding of the situation. Uh,
ओके not coming so i suggest you know i mean i'll call, uh, the next speaker can come in and then i'll have the data transfer to the you know i have a pen drive and present on the pen drive yeah so the next speaker dr chitra ramuthi again an expert in biometry and newer lenses and she will talk about mix and match the right choice any questions for the previous speakers as we are pulling up the uh mine is ready great uh my uh, thanks to the organizers of the uh, trichy uh, tricon uh, conference and uh, uh, dr hari priya and i go on to my talk uh, very good afternoon to one and all of you uh today as we stand customizing multifocal iols because we have a range of multifocal iols to the patient profile would definitely give us an optimal results but here then the main challenge is the selection because a person could be a short person a person could be a tall person because of which the arm length at which he's, he or she is going to use the reader would make a difference so it's so critical that we as uh, choose the right patient and when you try to look at a history like in 2009 there were only about 6.4% of the people who were uh, implanting premium multifocal iols in their practice and in 2017 it came up to about 7.8 but today in this last decade we are anywhere from 25 to 80% of our people who are using multifocal iols and what is because this is happening is because of the latest formula the technology and the confidence in the iol manufacturing however there is a specific chair time involved when you are assessing these patients so if you a wave front of light hits a diffractive iol a portion of the light goes to the distance which is the uh, uh, zero order of diffraction a portion of light goes to near with the first order of refraction and then there is 20% of the light is lost and this loss of light is what is the cause for the halos and the glare The other way of understanding this is multifocal iols work on the principle of simultaneous vision. When one image is in focus, the out of focus image is actually getting suppressed, and it is this out of focus suppressed image which is the cause for the halos. So it was these issues and challenges of glare, halo, of lack of contrast, which were the limiting factors. So now that we have different lenses in the market, the trifocals, the EDOFs, and the ability to do a mix and match, it has to be an individualized IOL selection, and definitely an individual uh, uh, one size is not going to fit all. Archana beautifully described to us what is a defocus curve. Honestly, it is the real world objective measure of an IOL performance. and i'm not going to go again all into it like if the person is best corrected with the intraocular lens in his eye and is focused for a bcv of 66 at distance if you can keep adding a minus 0.5 diopter lens on his trial frame and the patient till keep recording the vision till the patient can see and if it is equivalent to that if a one diopter of lens is placed is equivalent to what he is seeing Uh, at one meter, and if a four diopter lens is placed, and he still sees, it's about 25 centimeters. So that would tell you what is the range of lenses of each of these eyes, uh, of each of these intraocular lenses in this eye, and that would be a way of detecting what is the manufacturer promised. It has to be an ideal preoperative examination. We have to uh, rule out all those 
um, type A personalities who are going to be questioning you, who have taken a resolution not to be happy in life. You need to choose patients with realistic expectations. Do explain to them that neural adaptation helps enormous, enormous number of them. We need to look right from the ocular surface to the tear film, right up to the lens, whether there's any zonular weakness, right up to the retina at the OCT, macula to know whether there's any hidden pathology. And if there is any mevomian gland dysfunction, you could treat it. Because only if your tear film is okay, is your biometry going to be ideal? And that would be your way forward. And then later, go back and take the measurements. And of course, an OCT macula would tell you that you're not going to have a pathology which is going to further hit the contrast sensitivity. Treating even the smallest amount of astigmatism is mandatory. So now coming to the lenses, you have the trifocals, you have the EDOF and the mix and match. Of course, we have to do a perfect surgery, a perfect rexus overlap. And if you're on a femtocataract platform, it is going to be so repeatable and sure. Now, when you talk of trifocal technology, it is something which is going to give you a good distant vision and near vision and an intermediate vision, which is not going to impair the far and the near and there is no increase in dysphotopsia. Now, this is a patient who is retired, who wants great distance, intermediate and near vision and does not care if there's a little dysphotopsia. So here you see that the astigmatism was 0.74 and 0.59. We took him on the femtocataract platform and did an arcuate keratotomy along with the cataract surgery, which took care of the astigmatism and the patient did very well. Now, the, and when it comes to trifocal, we need to know that there are patients who would have need, uh, it has an intermediate at 60 centimeters and with some IOs, the intermediates is at a 90, uh, 80 centimeters, like 80 LISA and fine vision have 80 and pan optics at 60. Just for an example, I'm going to talk about pan optics here. The pan optics has an intermediate vision of 2.17 diopter for near, is the diffractive 15 rings it has. The important thing to note here is it has what is called an enlightened optical technology, which I would explain. More importantly, unlike the earlier multifocals, it gives 88% light transmission. Now, when you look at this, a conventional trifocal has one distant vision and two step heights. The quadrifocal hyals have three step heights. And what the panoptics has done is, it has one uh, first focal length point at of, uh, 40 centimeters, the intermediate, which is uh, at 60 centimeters, the third at 120 and infinity. What it has done is the 120 has been redistributed back to distance to give a distant vision so that it has 40, 60 and infinity, which means with majority of her work is at intermediate voice, work is at 60 centimeters. So it seems to make sense. Now, if you look at the defocus curve of some of the EDOFs and the trifocal, you can see like pan optics has crisp distance, intermediate and near, whereas the fine vision does well, has an intermediate at 80 centimeters. If you look carefully, the Technus Symphony is having good distance and fair intermediate, but not good near vision. So this gives us a summary of what lenses you're going to look at. Continuous range of vision, which was so well discussed by Arun Verman, gives you a continuous distance intermediate and near vision, a fair near vision. It is a combination of Technus multifocal, IO and an EDOF such that the patient is able to have the advantage, but it takes the advantage of thickness, and so it, there is a correction of spherical aberration. It has reduction of chromatic aberration because these are achromatic lenses, and these are also violet blocking lenses, because of which there is a, it, it decreases the scatter and the contrast by blocking the violet, and gives a continuous range of vision right from 33 centimeters to distance. So then, this is a case two. Now this patient, does not want great distance intermediate vision, but does not, is ready to have an occasional reading for which you could think of a lens like a Viviti lens. Now the Viviti lens has a one micron elevation and a two, two micron curvature change. And I'm not going to positive time, I can just tell you that it has got a stretch and shift kind of a waveform. It is a non-diffractive IL and gives you about plus one to 1.5 diopter of add. And this gives you a great distance vision and a fair amount of intermediate vision and you could do a micro mono vision give him a good distant vision and you can make him a little myopic in the non-dominant eye and and then allow him to manage for both distance and near now the eat of lenses like symphony which is not very much there in the market just to understand it uh, it gives 92 percent of the uh, uh, light transmission was possible with these lenses and if you again do a defocus curve 
which just tells you that the synergy gives you a continuous vision. The trifocals have a peak, a distance, intermediate and near, whereas the symphony falls off or near. Now, if it's a post lasic patient now, you need to evaluate the cornea, whether the topography is normal, whether there are no aberrations on the eye, you need to do an eye trace, you need to be sure that there are only internal aberrations which could be removed with the intraocular lens, you need to look at the angle alpha, it should not be more than 0.5 in an ideal scenario, though nowadays the optics of uh, the central optic zone of the modern lenses are more than 0.8, so you are able to increase your angle alpha and just still uh, use, uh, use these patients from premium IOL implant. But you also need to go on to the LASIK mode for these patients and then go ahead and in this particular patient, it was done some time back, a symphony was done in both eyes and the patient was quite happy. Now if it is a patient with some ocular comorbidity, a mild glaucoma, you could put an eye hands for his dominant of both eyes or eye hands for the dominant eye and do a micro monovision and give him a little myopia and little more add for the, the non-dominant eye. If it is an advanced glaucoma disease, it's best to leave him with a monofocal. When you want to do, before you think of doing a micro monovision, um, mix and match, you also could do go, go slow the strategy wherein you have implanted an IOL in one eye, you look at the patient, understand what are his disturbances and accordingly you use the second eye to titrate. When you talk of blended vision, if it is an eye hands as I had already alluded to in the earlier example, you give him a full distant vision eye hands and make him a little myopic of 0.5 and, or 0.75 in the left eye, in the non-dominant eye, and he is able to manage well. You could give him an eye hands in the right eye, and you could plan a pan optics in the left eye, which would give him a crisp near vision and a distant vision, and the great good vision of eye hands for distance would take him forward. You could even do a vivity uh, and do a micro mono vision in those eyes. The, there is this particular patient who did very well in his right eye, but he was not happy with his near vision. So a technis uh, multifocal of plus four diopter was used for his non-dominant eye and he could do well. There are finally some patients who are 6'6", six, six, not 6'6", six, six, uh, uh, full vision, but 6'6", six, six happy patients. We need not go digging around and uh, finding out how to get perfect and just let them be as they are because they have sort of neuroadaptive. It could be a patient who has initially gone for a monofocal lens. You could go ahead and plant a piggyback multifocal lenses, sulcoflex lenses, which are available nowadays in different um, companies. They have their own piggyback lenses, which could be implanted in these eyes. And you could give him a multifocality even in these patients. The deciding factor is... It has to be a true and tried platform. You may have to ask your friends, you may have to ask the company guys, you may have to try out a few lenses, go slow, take the feedback, give it a trial period, do the defocus curve. But I strongly believe the premium IOL component in our practice has been gradually, systematically going forward, not because of us. It's because of the biometry, because of the right formula, because of the IOLs which have come in. And also because we go in depth to understand what each of these lenses are offering and if you appropriately use it, our patients are quite realistic and they would be quite happy to acquire any of these lenses. Thank you very much. Thanks for a very comprehensive talk. I think that listed a lot of options we have today to give our patients uh, better refractive cataract surgery options. Uh, Arup, sir... Uh, so Dr. Arub will now give his talk on toric IOLs uh, being the way forward. Can I, can I be back on the screen? Yeah. So I mean, I'm happy to be back uh, for my second innings and uh, extremely sorry for the technical uh, problems that we encountered. I'll pick up the threads from where I had uh, left off. See, uh, we have been quite happy uh, using the toric lenses for the intermediate to high power uh, astigmatism. We have been using them, I think, personally more than 15 or 16 years. And the results have evolved. They have become better and better because of changing changes in technology, the way we work up our patients, better understanding of the intraocular lens power formulas, better availability of lenses. So things are becoming better. And we have no hesitation in suggesting uh, a 
toric lens for patients with intermediate to high astigmatism. Now the question arises, you know, it is uh, what do we do in patients with low astigmatism? So in my setup, uh, all, all, all cataract patients are worked up. The basic uh, eye will formula that is used is the Barrett toric calculator. So that if the calculator suggests satoric lenses, the ball is back in the patient's coat, then he or she takes the call, what kind of lens uh, he, the patient wants. The problem here is there is a feeling that measurement of the axis may not be very repeatable in whatever equipment that we use here, and the results may not be as good as uh, what you have anticipated. You know, I mean, this month itself, there's an article in JCRS uh, from Oliver Friendel and his group in Vienna, which showed a very good comparability in terms of repeatability and reproducibility among the various devices that were used. So uh, these uh, uh, toric lenses for low astigmatism was found to be beneficial in terms of un uh, uncorrected distance visual acuity. It significantly reduced the measured astigmatism in both auto diffraction and subjective diffraction mode. So it makes a lot of sense in using toric lenses for all grades of astigmatism. You know, the, the success story of toric ads basically have multiple chapters. You know, the patient, patient selection has to be properly done. We have to be aware of the contraindications. Some of them are relative contraindications. The eye has to be, have to be prepared uh, for proper biometry, and once you start doing the biometry, the newer technology devices have to be used. Uh, a, appropriate toric cal calculator has to be used. These calculators have undergone a lot of advances in the recent past use a good quality toric intracural lens. I won't say the previous lenses were bad, but our experiences have taught us many lessons and new, uh, better toric lenses have come up in the market. And of course, the, your surgical technique. I normally take a temporal clear corneal approach for all my toric cases, not on the steep axis, 4.5 to 5 millimeter rexes. Evacuate the OVD as completely as possible from the capsular fornices, particularly where the haptics are resting on the capsular fornix and I mark on the slit lamp preoperatively. So, and sometimes it is markerless because I remember which are the congenital vessels or any, any nevus or any pigmentation. So, sometimes you can just you know, memorize and uh, on the table you can mark and when it, when it comes to alignment, you put the lens in the proper axis. And postoperatively, I, mean, I would keep the lens a little hypotonous. So, I have been pretty happy. This is the surgical technique and you know, these are the list of contraindications. Some of them are, are uh, you know, relative contraindications. Now, uh, we all have uh, understood the importance of identifying ocular surface disease in all premium myel patients because if your ocular surface is not properly worked out, properly optimized, the toric axis that you get may be uh, wrong. You may get a wrong IL power, so it doesn't make much sense. Uh, we must be thankful to Dr. Dow Koch for uh, reinventing or rather, you know, reigniting our interest in posterior corneal astigmatism. And this definitely plays a very important role in not in routine cases, but in complex uh, situations. I'll be referring to it uh, in a few slides from now. So I had made a, sim a similar talk six years earlier, and whether it is necessary to measure the posterior corneal astigmatism, because you know it requires uh, sophisticated devices, they may be more expensive, and are they really necessary? So this particular study had concluded that it is not crucial to buy a device to measure posterior corneal astigmatism, but it is important to understand it and take it into account during surgery. Uh, it is important for us to have a good toric calculator. So these are the attributes I am looking for in the calculator. In earlier on, uh, these are the generic calculators, uh, so like Barrett site, Noel Alpine site, and there are a couple of other individual practitioner sites which are more complete. The, the, the factory uh, uh, toric calculators like Alcon, AMO, a those days, uh, so they were not, they had certain de deficiencies. So basically, you know, we, the, it should be able to give you an alert on the axis flip. I always go for the minimum uh, residual astigmatism, even if the axis is flipped a little bit, it is okay. Uh, the calculator should take into account the influence of the keratometry, that is steep or flat cornea, the anterior chamber depth on the astigmatic part of toric IOL. So most of the modern formulas have take, taken that into account. The toric calculator should also have a, a facility to include the posterior corneal astigmatism values for in a complex site like post refractive surgery, post refractive surgery eyes, or very steep corneas, or you know such non-virgin corneas. And uh, my go-to calculator is the Barrett toric calculator. The Barrett toric calculator has a K integrated K calculator, which means you know you can integrate value K values from three devices, and it gives you. A, a integrated K reading, and it is optional. If you want to do it, you could do it. 
Then it also have the option of using the predicted posterior corneal astigmatism, which is done uh, mathematically. Or if you have really measured it in complex scenario, then input the PCA, the posterior corneal astigmatic data, and then it calculates uh, accordingly. So again, uh, this is how to calculate the K calculator. Uh, the Kane formula is, a, is the new kid in the block. You know, the, particularly the Kane has come up with his mono, monofocal formula, toric formula, as well as astigmatic, uh, astigmatic uh, keratometric, I mean, keratoconus formulas. So six years or three years back, he published his work on this, and he compared his formula with the Barrett Universal Barrett toric calculator, Abu Lafayette Cock, EVO 2.0, Nasse 7, and Holiday 2, and he came up with this result that his formula gave much superior results. Statistically significant results may not be clinically different, but statistically significant results compared to the other formulas. So, in terms of the proportion of patients getting uh, a vision within the predi pre prediction error of 0 0.5 diopter, 0 0.75 diopter, or 0 0.1 diopter, or, or 1 diopter, was higher with the Kane formula. Now, recently, I mean, just last month, there was an, another article, a similar article uh, by uh, the Yudazia group from Israel where they compared the barrett toric calculator based on the measured posterior corneal astigmatism with the barrett toric calculator without, with the predicted corneal astigmat, posterior corneal astigmatism, the cane toric calculator, and the abulafia coke calculator. And results were different. Uh, the results were different in the sense that it showed that cane formula did not perform as well as the other three formulas that were uh, in, included in the study. There is a statistically significant difference in terms of the median absolute prediction error as well as the mean centroid prediction error. But this does not uh, translate into clinical relevance. But statistically, definitely, K and formula was not giving as good uh, outcome as these three, form three other formulas. So, uh, so basically, this particular study uh, concluded that in average eyes, directly measuring the PCA for toric IL part calculation is not superior to theoretically account for, accounting for it. So basically, you don't really need to measure PC in routine eyes. Now, this was a very landmark article. We have been using a lot of toric lenses, and sometimes we feel that some lenses are very freely mobile within a capsular bag, and they do rotate in the postoperative period. Now, David Chang came up with this uh, landmark article where he, huge number of cases, you know, one, two, seven, three, almost equally distributed between accuracy of toric and technus toric, where he showed that the the thickness toric patients rotated much more in a statistically significant as well as a clinically significant relevant way compared to the actress of toric. So this is actually the, the, the thickness toric which basically tended to rotate counterclockwise, actress of rotated clockwise. And with the rule astigmatism was a factor uh, common to both the lenses where a higher incidence of lens rotation was uh, noticed. And uh, the, he did not find any relevance of CT at improving the rotational stability. There are certain predictors, a large amount of the torical rotation, which included a long axial length, a lower spherical IL power, basically they're the same, or with the rule, ast uh, with the rule uh, astigmatic axis. So the company came up with uh, the Technis uh, uh, Toric 2 lens. You know, they modified the haptics uh, so that, you know, it, it, it became, they called it a fro the frosted haptics and it increases the resistance uh, rotation to rotation between the haptic and the capsular fornix. And it also results in a significantly shorter unfolding time. So Technus uh, 2 different lens, which is still available in the Indian market, and it has been taken, and uh, Technus 1 is still available, can have just 30, uh, one, one minute more, because we don't have one speaker we can fill in. So in India, in, the, in our country, we still have the Technus uh, uh, Toric 1 available, but in the Western world, they have pulled, pulled back these lenses from the market. And the results have become pretty good, actually. In fact, this was a study with Technus Ihan Storic 2, and 96% uh, of the patients showed rotation less than 5 degrees. Normally, when you go in for an intervention is when the lens has rotated 10 degrees or more than that. So these patients did not have any need for any re-rotation. In fact, the maximum rotation notice was, uh, was only 6.2 degrees, so which is very well within the limits of surgical re-intervention. So they had certain, uh, now the, the, I don't personally use these lenses, the plate haptic lenses, the hydrophilic lenses with the hydrophobic cap, uh, uh, coating. You know, these are uh, basically 11 millimeter long lenses with six millimeter optic. So these lenses also uh, were uh, published, results of the study with this lens were published from China in March, JCDS. And uh, they found out that uh, this maximum rotation occurred within one hour to one day post-op. First three days post-op, there's a high. It was a high risk period for the plate haptic toric lenses to rotate, and the other risk factors were elderly patients, longer axial length, 
lens thickness more than 4.48 millimeters. So basically, they advise the patients to go on rest for almost three days and avoid strenuous activities for one month to get good results with these lenses. So, you know, I mean, of course, today we have the light adjustable lenses that are coming up, the refractive index uh, shaping with the femtosecond and laser. So they, it is also going to hit the market, Western market uh, soon. Till such things happen, you know, we need to uh, be continue, we need to continue to use the torrid chirals, which have great potential if you properly select your patients, if a proper technology is employed, right torrid calculator is chosen, right IOL is chosen, and if you follow a good surgical technique. Thank you very much for your attention. Excellent talk, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we are concluding this session uh, because we are running out of time. Uh, thanks very much to all the speakers uh, for sharing a lot of pearls here. Thank you.